Right then, I have literally just finished watching the Bad Batch finale, so let's talk about this, shall we? I've had no time to formulate thoughts whatsoever. It's not true. I have a super fast brain, like the smart one who's dead. I, it's tech, I know. I, I'm just, I'm just waking you up. So, where to start? I guess this is sort of a review of the final season and specifically the last episode, although I've only ever made one previous video on this show and it was like two months ago. So, you know, I guess I can talk broadly about the entire Bad Batch experience as well. I think it's all come together as a very solid show. It's... I don't think it's better than Rebels and I don't think it's better than The Clone Wars. I think it's... I think it's up there with one of the better Clone Wars arcs, just sort of stretched out over three seasons. Like, there's some Clone Wars arcs which are just trash, and there's some Clone Wars arcs which are, like, some of the best Star Wars ever, and it's, you know, it's somewhere on the higher end of that scale. I think potentially it could have benefited from one more season, but I gather that it's not been the most popular show ever, which is not that surprising because it's about the Bad Batch. It's quite a strange name if you just, you know, don't know anything else about Star Wars. And this is very much a you-need-to-have-done-your-homework kind of show. Because um, it's a show where people will just show up, like Tarkin or Cody or Rex, and the show just assumes you know who that is. And to be fair, back in the day the show did start with, like, the Bad Batch logo burning out of the Clone Wars logo, so it was never pretending to be anything other than that. But yeah, that's not to say I think the show was rushed, per se. I think where we ended up was where the show was always leading. It's just, I think they could have used more time in the middle there somewhere to... I don't know. Um, mainly I'm thinking the, the sort of screen time dynamics of the last season are not balanced very well. Wrecker and Echo definitely get the shortest end of the stick there. They get some stuff to do in the finale, but for the most part for the last season, they've just kind of been around, or in Echo's case, not even around, which is, you know, fine, because can I be real with you? Echo was always the most boring member of the squad. I don't necessarily think he's a bad character, but the show never had a clear idea of what to do with him, because... And I felt this since he joined the squad in Clone Wars Season 7, which is he doubles up roles with tech. You know, in your classic squad dynamic, you need a couple, like, archetypes to fill certain roles. So we've got we've got the big guy, we've got the leader, we've got the sniper, and we've got um, the smart guy. And then Echo is a cyborg and is also, like, a techie guy. So having two of them on the team at the same time never really made sense from, like, a... a uh, strategic team construction point of view and that always kind of left him secondary to tech because tech was better at it. That's why initially I thought killing off tech was a good idea because it it rebalances the team properly because okay let's we'll talk about tech a bit more shall we get back to this echo point in a sec because I just want to say thank god the tech stayed dead and I don't say that because I dislike the character, I say that because because it was a good death and it was thematically appropriate and it raised the stakes for the last season because it proved that none of them are safe. But from a like strategic writing perspective, I, I totally understand why they killed off Tech because he was too smart and solved too many problems. It's kind of, that's kind of always the problem when you write a character who's a genius is they can just solve all your problems. So that's why they killed him off. But yeah, it, towards the end of the season, even, even I was getting sucked into the CX2 is tech conspiracy theories. And I was genuinely worried about it because I, I know it's like a joke in Star Wars. You know, no one's ever really gone. Everyone always comes back to life, right? And that even happened in the season with another character, which we'll get to. But I... I think it was a thematically appropriate death, and I'm glad they didn't go back on it. And I think, I think the show did a good job of making you feel his absence without all the characters just crying about it all the time, because they're not that kind of character. They're soldiers, you know. They control their emotions a bit better, but his absence was felt in the 
the dynamics of the squad were wrong for the entire season, basically. Because they didn't have a smart guy, and without him, they were just a bunch of dumbasses. So yeah, I expected Echo to kind of come back in and fill that smart guy role, which he kind of does at the end, in the final sort of run of episodes. And I think it's very funny that he's so much more competent than the rest of the Bad Batch. Like, he's infiltrating the base, he's doing all this stuff, he's sending off signals and all that, and sneaking around in disguise. Meanwhile, the Bad Batch are in the jungle getting ravaged by a big monkey monster. <laughs> and I think that's, um, that's, that's kind of intentional. I think a big through line of this season was, like, Maybe it's time for the Bad Batch to retire. Maybe this is, like, their last fight. And I think that's an interesting kind of... It's an interesting story to weave into a show like this. That you can't you can't keep up this level of badassery forever. And eventually it's time to just sort of settle down and live a normal life again. And that's kind of been the thematic through line since the start of the show when they went to talk to the deserter guy. And none of them died, apart from Echo, apart from Tech, none of them died. Which I'm fine with. I know I I went into the season expecting them to rogue one it where they would all die, but I think that was me being too cynical. I think I think looking back, this is where the show was leading. It's not like a it's it's bittersweet, which I think people have people focus too much on the better of bittersweet and not on the sweet of bittersweet when people say it's a bittersweet ending. It's it's sweet, it's nice, everyone gets their happily ever after, but they are changed by the experience and they're never going to be like the squad and the warriors that they once were. And that is that is bitter. It's, you know, things have changed and not necessarily for the better, but at least they can have some some level of peace now. I think season three generally has been the strongest season of the show. Um, there's a couple episodes in season two, like the Outposts, which I think are like overall like those are like peak Star Wars. But I think it's been a really solid season. I... People have been complaining about some of the middle episodes being filler, and <sighs> I'm getting really sick of that word of people throwing around the word filler. It's it's to the point where I, I think it's lost meaning. I think we need to put it down like old yeller, the word filler. Because, you know, back in my day, when I was a kid, filler had a very specific meaning. It was a thing in anime where they run out of source material to adapt. So they just make 60 episodes of freaking nonsense to fill time while the, the manga artist works on making new story that they can adapt. That's what filler means to me. But filler seems to me now, like, any episode or even any, like, moments in an episode that don't directly affect the plot of the show. And I I find that really frustrating, especially in a show like this, which is episodic. Like, there's a couple of episodes in particular that got hit with the, the filler label. And it's the episode with Fennec Shand and then the episode with Ventress. And neither of those episodes are necessarily about advancing the overall plot. Because because they're just not. But that doesn't make them filler. Kind of a, a question that the show needed to answer is what's the deal with Omega? Why does everyone want her? And that's the thing you have to answer eventually. But reality is answering that question is not a full episode. So you take some time, you do some other stuff. You have Hunter and Wrecker go find some gators in the alien bayou. <laughs> and... That's fine, because that's what the show is. It's it, That doesn't make it filler. And I think the other part of that episode was super important too. It was the... It was just the taking time with Crosshair and Omega kind of helping him heal and, and readjust to life. Because part of his thing this season is he, he has a, a tremor in his hand, right? And I think it's... It's really powerful, actually, that he never fully resolves that. Like, he tries, he tries to make it better, but eventually gets his hand cut off. So he's never going to be the sniper that he was before, and that's fine. And there's more to life, and you can keep going. And 
again, like that that learning when to learning when to rest and you know stop fighting is an important narrative through line of this season and the show. Okay, so the other episode is the one with Ventress, and I'll say up front, I I really don't care that they brought Ventress back from the dead. Um, long time ago, I made a video about Ventress. Um, because she's one of my favourite characters and I, the book Dark Disciple, which is the book where she dies um, I never loved that for her <laughs> obviously, right? I don't love death for anyone but in terms of like a thematic beat on her story, it's not like it's not like the be all end all of like well, this character had to die here for these important thematic reasons. It felt much more like the normal prequel Jedi death, which is, well, they weren't in the original movies, so I guess they have to die. And I feel like now um, they're more comfortable with not doing that, with just having characters live and like, yeah, they weren't in the movies, but that doesn't mean they weren't around still. You know, the galaxy's a big place. They could be anywhere. Death isn't the only option. So yeah, they don't explain it, but I think that's more of a teaser for future things. There's a couple directions they could go after this show, and I guess we'll see. But that Ventress is definitely one of them, and one that I would be interested in seeing. But in terms of her place in this episode, in this show, um, I can see why people would think that episode is filler. I don't think it is, because it's there to kind of cement the... the Omega isn't a Jedi, which uh, that has been a theory since the first episode of the show, so I understand why you'd want to take some time to kind of fully debunk that idea, even if they kind of leave it slightly open-ended at the end. And I like Ventress, and you know, it's fine, but more importantly, it was uh, it's the last quiet episode of the show, looking back, you know, it doesn't have lots of action, they fight a big sea monster for a little bit, but that's really it. The episode is called The Harbinger. It's it's an, it's the quiet before the storm. And just because it's not necessarily pushing the plot along, it is it's building up tension. It's building up this this pressure and this feeling that everything's about to hit the fan before everything hits the fan. So yeah, and in, in my professional critic opinion, I don't think this season has a filler problem. I think I think people are massively overusing that term. And I don't want to complain about the kids and their attention spans or whatever, but I think this is a gen generally well-paced show. As I say, I think it could have benefited from a season, another season, because a lot of it feels paced a little bit too fast, even. Because as I was saying, Wrecker really doesn't get anything to do this season. Echo gets some stuff to do in the last couple episodes. Hunter even is pretty just from where he was at season one, the the real focus of this season has been Omega and Crosshair, which, if you're going to focus on characters, focus on those two, because they're my favourite, but, you know, the balance is off, and there's a lot of side characters that really don't get a lot of play, like, I was expecting more of Fee this season, I don't, I don't necessarily even like Fee, but... It's weird that she only shows up for one episode. I was expecting more from her and sort of the people of Pabu in general, but it, it's like the season just didn't have time for that. And there's other stuff like we never really get a wrap up on Sid, like CX2 mentions at one point that he interrogated her for information, but I feel like if we had more time we would maybe see that and just have like some sort of wrap up on this character who was pretty important to the first two seasons of the show and yeah she betrayed them but like what's the resolution to that she she took a she took a, a briefcase full of money and walked out of the show never to be seen again and and don't get me wrong I don't like Sid I think she was always kind of a boring character but it is weird that we never kind of go back to that and close the loop on that one and there's other open threads too like what happened to Cody um how do Rex, Wolf, and Gregor end up on that desert planet? Um, and that's that's maybe beyond the scope of this show because this is the Bad Batch, right? But I do think if this show was given more time, then maybe we would answer some more of those questions. 
I think the finale is good. I am glad that it was a double length episode. I was worried for a minute that it was going to be 20 minutes and that would be way too short, but they did double length it, so that's good. I don't think it was perfect. I, I enjoyed it. I like where everything ended up. I think there's some parts of it where I'm like, hey, that could have gone a little bit better. Like, the final end of Rampart, I think, is great, where he goes out like a little bitch trying to get back in with the Empire and he blows up for his troubles. And I think it's quite it's quite poignant that it's Nalisi who does it because like Rampart's biggest crime in this show was destroying Camino, right? So the last Camino kind of Camino and blowing him up. You know, there's there's some there's some ironic resonance there, and that's good. I think the way that a uh, hemlock goes out is kind of whatever. Um people kind of I don't know. I I've seen a lot of like deep hatred for Hemlock as like not like as a bad character, but like he's a bad guy. And I never really felt that for him. He's never really been evil enough for me to be like, oh, this guy needs to die. He was always just sort of like a he's a very he's, he's fine. He's quite a generic evil scientist man, and he goes out like kind of an evil generic scientist man, and I was kind of hoping for more. I like that, you know, um, Crosshair, he finally makes the shot that he's been trying to do all season. But yeah, at the end of the day, Hemlock was he was he was quite a generic villain. The villains have never been the strongest part of this show. And obviously a Scorch goes out like a bitch. So that's probably gonna piss off some people, but having not played Republic Commando, it doesn't really bother me that much. Uh the the, the anti bad batch, the good batch, I don't know, um, were fine. Again, this is a thing where if we had more time, I imagine they would be more of a kind of rival that was built up for more of the season. Having them just sort of show up in the last episode as this like squad of reverse bad batch people, it's fine, but it's a concept that could have done with being more fleshed out, I think. Uh, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that Omega got herself out and ended up being the one to rescue the Bad Batch because I think that's such a perfect, like, encapsulation of the themes. Like, they're getting too old for this. They're getting too old. They're injured. They're, they're not ready for this, but she's young and spry and she's, she's still got a lot of fight left in her. And I think that, I think that works thematically. I think Emery is a character that definitely needed more development. Um, she's okay. She did get that one episode, but an another thing where I feel like we needed more time here to kind of flesh out what her deal is and how she came to work with Hemlock and why she's the only other female clone, because that seems quite relevant. Th there's a lot of unanswered questions there, which some of that is fine. I'm fine with leaving some up stuff open to speculation, but I think not knowing enough about her is, it robs her sort of redemption arc of a lot of the narrative weight that it could have. Because as it is, she basically, she sees some children and she inherits that Django Fett gene where they all immediately want to adopt and protect any children they find. It's a, it's a known thing. And of course, the final, final thing of the last episode is a flash forward. I'm going to guess it's like 10 years or so. Omega looks to be in like her early 20s, I would guess. And it's her going off to join the rebellion. And I don't know how to feel about this. The shot before this of them all sitting in the courtyard, just kind of relaxing at peace. That would have been a fine ending for me. I didn't necessarily need this flash forward. I don't dislike it, even if seeing like grown up Amiga really like freaked me out for a second. And, and like a, oh my god, she's all grown up. My my daughter thing. I don't know. It it freaked me out. She was all tall and lanky, and it's strange. But um, yeah, it it was a, it was a good scene. It was you know it was fine. It was um, yeah, and it was okay. <laughs> um, I don't I don't I. Uh... It, it's something I was kind of expecting them to do a bit to sort of... It feels very much like instead of an ending for this show, it feels like a teaser for like, and we'll see Omega next time in Star Wars Omega or whatever the next show is. It, it felt like a sort of tie-in to whatever the next thing was rather than the, the final end of this show. 
Which, look, if they do another thing with Omega, I'll watch it. I like Omega just fine. I, I think she's one of my favourite characters in this show. So I'll continue to watch her adventures. But that's kind of the... It's a trademark of watching Star Wars shows at this point, which is even when a story ends, it's not the end of the story. Everything is always feeding into something else. And that's okay. That's the quality of Star Wars storytelling at the moment, which is not... It's not necessarily bad, it's just something that you have to kind of accept that nothing is ever really over. Things just sort of move into the other things. And I think that really annoys some people. I think it's okay, but it does. It does make this show feel a little less conclusive in its own thing than it maybe could be. Anyway, in terms of future, in, in future, because I, I seriously doubt this is the last animated show we're going to get. There's Ventress. They could do a Ventress show, which I would be on board with. Um, a lot of people have been speculating and theorising that they're going to do a Clone Rebellion show with Echo and Rex and all that crew, which I don't see that happening. I can see why people think that, but to me, in, in like my marketing brain, having a clone show all about the clones followed by another clone show all about the clones, it doesn't... The wires don't really work for me on that one. I feel like, I don't know, they could do it. And the, the way um, Echo leaves the show is he kind of goes like that and walks off into the sunset. It's like, I'll see you in my own show, boys. So maybe that's the case. As you can hear, I'm, I'm losing my voice here. I've been talking for half an hour. So maybe that's the case. And then, of course, the third one is follow Omega and her journeys in the Rebellion, which I can also see happening. Maybe not right away, but... I think I think Omega is popular, and I think they could build a show around her, an another show around her. So I don't know. I think those are our three options right now. I see. I I think we're gonna stick in this mid um, between prequels and original trilogy era for a bit longer because if it is ten years after that flashback, we're still not a rebels era because you can see in like uh, Hunter's beard, he's got a bit of grey, but he's not nearly as grey as as uh, Rex was. So, I don't know. Overall, good show. I am, um, I think besides Andor, it's probably the strongest thing on Disney Plus. And I'm including the Marvel shows in that as well, probably. <laughs> it was good. It was solid. I, I have some minor problems with it, but overall, it was a solid show. Right, let's try and squeak this one out, shall we? Thank you very much for watching, and a very special thank you to my wonderful patrons for your continued support. If you'd like to see your name up here or support the things I do, then please consider signing up. It would mean a lot to me, as well as a like, a comment, a share, and subscribe if you're just wanting to help out. That would also be very nice. I'm really, I'm really running out of steam here. Um, Crosshair video I made a few weeks ago. The show didn't invalidate it, which is nice, so you can watch that and learn all about Crosshair's redemption arc. Or for other Star Wars things. Check out this Jedi Survivor video I made last year. I still think this is one of my best videos, so you should go watch it.